So my argument is that if the evolution means just spreading your DNA as far and wide as you can, yeast domesticated humans. They got us to work for them and shoot their DNA off way into outer space. We could be yeast, actually, because uh, the family tree, we're closer. We could be yeast. We, we, yeah, we're, we're closer to yeast than uh, lactobacillus so, like bacteria. So we could be yeast, you know. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Kentucky Commons Radio Hour. I am Michael Moeller, joined today by John Renane. Hello. David Satterley. Hey. We are not at uh, Bluegrass Homebrew Supply in Louisville. We are at White Labs in Asheville, North Carolina. Also joined by Pablo Gomez, the Technical Account Manager for the Southeast and Latin America, and Devin Tani, the Education Coordinator. Devin, Pablo, thanks for coming on and you know, inviting us in. Us. Thank Fine. you for having us. Yeah, this is, uh, is going to be a good conversation. Uh, this is going to be a little bit, you know... I don't want to say a heady conversation, but we're going to be talking a lot about like, you know, yeast and how that, you know, affects what we what we usually like to drink. We, we want to learn all about what you all do here at White Labs. Uh, but first, uh, we're going to do a traditional uh, beer share that we always like to do. Uh, David has a beer for us. Great. Yeah, we wouldn't uh, show up empty handed ever. <laughs> so <laughs> we did bring you um, one of our favorite beers from our home state of Kentucky. This is a Kentucky common ale. Have you all you you've had Kentucky Commons before? I've tried before. I, I love a Kentucky Common with the rye <laughs> bill. Oh my god, that was so good. You got it. So this is from Dreaming Creek out of Richmond, uh, Kentucky. It's about I don't know seventy five miles away from us, but this is always a good one to share and to have around. Uh, they do such a good job with it. So I'm interested to see what you all think of it. Yeah, it's a it's a good style. It's a style that we like to try to talk about because you know being in Kentucky, obviously things. When the first thing that people think about is bourbon. Uh, I think the Kentucky Common is a very special uh, recipe uh, and that we can own and should own a little bit more. So whenever we like to travel, we like to bring it with us to just kind of, you know, preach that gospel of Kentucky Common. Ooh, a crushable rye. Crushable rye. <laughs> There's a long standing debate in the, uh, you know, annals of Kentucky Common history. You guys are kind of in the yeast world. Uh, sour or unsour, if you're thinking about the historical style for Kentucky Common. I've mainly heard it was sour. I've always heard it was a mixed culture, right? yeah. Because you're using a lot of like the rye malt and everything. So, but I've never had it um, as a mixed culture with that slight acidity. I've always uh, mainly had it on a homebrew scale, and that's where I fell in love with it. When we brew it with folks in the shop, we either just use your all's uh, California yeast or sometimes like the cream ale blend. Uh, that's what we most commonly use. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I know too. Yeah, but I, I was looking it. through your all's catalog this morning. I want to try it with the Kentucky bourbon yeast because uh, the story goes that like really it was maybe it was sour sometimes, but that's probably because they would <clears throat> age it in like pine pitch barrel lined casks back in the day. So even if they thought they were getting a pure pitch of yeast and it was supposed to be you know a, a clean finishing dark cream ale. Uh, a lot of times it probably ended up with some funk in there after sitting in those barrels. But I want to try it with that bourbon yeast. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. So as we're enjoying these beers, um, can you just both give us a little bit of an overview of what you all do for White Labs? Um, I'm a technical manager. Um, like you said, I have a the Southeast Territory, um, Latin America. You know, I'm originally from Argentina, I guess it makes sense uh, to say that. And um, basically, you know, it's visiting breweries, helping them with anything related, you know, with fermentation, um, you know, yeast management. Um, but also, you know, uh, as other part of my, the job that I do is like also help not only my territory, but in the whole, you know, all our customers, you know, um, when anything goes a little above what, you know, our customer service team can handle, you know, it comes to me and, and that's kind of one of the things I do daily. Devin? Yeah. Um, how I started, I actually started as a lab tech. So, um, I worked in the yeast lab as well as our analytical lab in San Diego. So uh, that's a third party TTB certified lab. Um, so I'm a scientist by heart. Uh, and then eventually from that, I moved into R&D, did a bunch of R&D for white labs and presented at MBAA ASBCs. And they're like, hey, you're really, really good at talking and presenting. So they actually moved me to marketing. So now I'm part of the technical uh, education coordinator. I do a bunch of workshops, such as uh, we do workshops here at White Labs called Yeast Essentials. 
Um, and then I'm also giving talks at NBA, ASBC, but also making sure all our collateral, our blogs and stuff are technically sound and scientifically correct. And we're actually filming and recording this today in the lab that you are here for. I mean, you're coming in from San Diego to uh, conduct some yeah. studies yeah. here. Well, yeah. So pretty much uh, this lab, as you could see, is more of like a almost like a university lab of it's very open. It's very spacious uh, to allow students to come in and get hands on training of how to use a microscope, how to get certain QAQC parameters for getting better yeast handling, better quality control on their beer. So that's uh, what we're trying to do is uh, help educate um, consumers on uh, proper yeast management. And certainly we want to share with our listeners kind of the history of White Labs. Uh, you guys have been around for a long time, but maybe before that, uh, we, you know, we, we kind of, I at least always come from a kind of a homebrewer's perspective. Do you guys have personal stories? It sounds like, you know, maybe you were more into science and then got into beer or more into beer and science. Do you guys kind of both have a, a short version of how you kind of got into this whole crazy world? <laughs> what came yeah. first, the science or the beer? Uh, for me, the beer. <laughs> <laughs> then I found that fermentation was uh, the part that I enjoyed the most out of you know, the whole brewing process. But for me, it started by, you know, home brewing um, early 2000s. Uh, and I was living in Miami at the time. And uh, I had to order um, yeast. There was now a homebrew shop around yeah. and I had to order yeast, um, you know, from who, who knows where, uh, and, <laughs> and, um, and it happened that, you know, uh, the first yeast I ordered was a liquid yeast and it was Y Labs. So, you know, I stick at the time where right, you were like, you're either brew with or ferment with Y Labs or Y's, right? That was like, kind of like, and you, you stick, you, you know, you used to stick with what, you or know. Or that like, who knows how old pack of fermentist that's like on a strange pack or yes. like shelf in like liquor <laughs> barn or something. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I started home brewing and because uh, you know my first language is spanish um i got in contact with the cicerone program and uh, i kind of started helping them you know so doing some edits um you know and the, when they was, they were like translating their some of their programs and i did a little bit of that with the cymergy magazine for oh, the nice. american homebrew association and yeah and then that's how it kind of started Nice. I was totally the opposite route, Pablo. Like, <laughs> I did science first. Uh, I also loved food science. Like, I'm a huge Good Eats aficionado. Yeah, and I Alan Brown, it. shout out. Yeah. That was I, one of the first videos I ever watched was his homebrewing video that got me interested in ooh, it. Ooh, yeah, okay. Amber Waves of Grain way back in the day. I need to go watch yeah. that, actually. Yeah. It's good. Okay. But yeah, I always love food. Um, so I did chemistry, and I did some biotech in San Diego, and it just wasn't for me. It was a lot of grueling, long hours of doing pipette work. So yeah. Um, I wanted to get back into food science and luckily for me, San Diego was a huge Mecca. Uh, food science was craft beer. So I actually did uh, a certificate, brewing certificate at UCSD extension. Luckily enough, some of the big dogs um, were teaching those courses. So like Stone, Ballast Point, all that were teaching those courses. So I was able to get a foot in the door. I actually interned at Carl Schrauss. Um, and then from that, I never stopped it. Like, okay, I'm going to be food science, but QAQC lab stuff for breweries because that realm and just talking about beer it's it's art form and science and it's combined and mesh so perfectly well and so it sounds like you guys kind of are the perfect like amalgamation of like what white labs represents uh, we talk a lot about kind of the history of the craft beer movement and beer in general on this show you know beer is i think the oldest beer they found at this point is like from like the natufian caves in like uh, israel Palestine area. It's like 13,000 years old. People have been doing this forever and it's always been known. It's some kind of cereal grain. It's usually some kind of herbaceous plant, most commonly these days, hops, uh, water. And in fact, if you ask like the Germans, like via the Reimskabolt, like yeast wasn't even mentioned as an ingredient historically. Mm -hmm. um, Louis Pasteur, I think, started figuring that stuff out. But, you know, craft beer, a lot of people just associate it with like the hops and the malts and all that kind of stuff. But as you were saying, yeast is the most important part. Yeast is kind of the magic ingredient. And to me, White Labs was the company when I found out about it. That's kind of when I opened my eyes to the whole world of yeast. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the ethos behind how White Labs started and kind of how you guys carry that forward just with promoting, you know, all things fermentation and yeast? Yeah, well, it's right. It, I think both are correlated, right? Like, uh, you know, starting as a scientist starting because you like beer right it's it's about you know we love this we love the industry right um and so you know same as with chris white right he he is a passionate about you know this industry 
And that's how it started, you know, uh, 1995, you know, he happened to be on the right place, San Diego, right, at the right time, meeting the right people, right, when he was starting, like, you know, in college, he was starting homebrewing, became friends with um, uh, two guys who were like, um, they own a homebrew shop in San Diego at the time, uh, Homebrew Mart. And they happened to be like um, developing recipes because their dream was to open a brewery. <laughs> they ended up opening Ballast Point. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> so um, basically, Chris learned, and the you know the three of them, right, Jack um, and Chris, uh, you know, they all learned together. And, and basically, for what they said is like you know they start asking Chris, why don't you? You know, anything you can do, you know, with what you're studying, you know, have you done anything with yeast? And that's when Chris got more into, you know, the to see what was available, right, at the time. Um, and I think the first big innovation Wild Labs did, um, you know, through Chris was um, creating the first pitchable yeast in the industry, right? Before Wild Labs, um, you could get uh, the uh, liquid yeast, but um, it was not concentrated the way it is nowadays, right? Um, kind of the race of who got the best yeast kind of like start pushing labs to concentrate more and more and more every year. Every, but uh, at the time, right, you uh, that's when uh, starters became uh, popular, right? Because if you will not make a starter, um, that, you know, when you buy liquid yeast at the time, it was not enough yeast to, to you know, to brew, uh, to ferment your your beer. So I think that's the first thing uh, Wild Labs did um, and concentrate the, the yeast in a way that, you know, you could, you know, pitch it right, you know, into your um, bucket or whatever you were like fermenting at the time. Um, but really humble beginnings, uh, as Chris and Lisa were telling me too, like, you know, the first, one of the first customers was uh, Big Support in San yeah. Diego. And they were uh, trading uh, yeast for pizza in the parking lot yeah. at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's about the passion. It's about, you know, try to be better. And that's what we've been doing since that year. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about what you all do as well, and you were one of the first to do this. I mean, you guys do your classic California strains, and I'm sure that's kind of what it was in the beginning. But you guys really have done a lot of you know research. And you know, these days when we go sit down to order all of the different strains of yeast for our home brewers uh, in the shop, I can be like, hey, we literally have these yeasts that come from all of these different brewing regions all over the world. Um, what does that process look like? How do you guys find those different strains? And you know, you can get uh, the Hefeweizen strain from you know northern regions of Germany, or you can get your alls like Bavarian wit. What does that look like? How do you guys you know find these things and bring them back here to be able to identify and culture them, keep them going for for brewers and home brewers alike? Yeah, well, um, a lot of that yeast collection is what's funny is yeast is, have been domesticated for so long they're almost like wolves to dogs. Um, so find them naturally occurring doesn't happen as often, but, um, there's so many yeast banks around the world and, we, uh, Dr. Chris White's done a bunch of collections as well. So we have a minus 80 cryogenically freezer that we store all these different yeasts. So we not only provide like 80 core strains year round, but we have so many hundreds more in the bank that we just like found maybe swab from, uh, what old shipwrecks, yeah. uh, we, we brewed someone's with, a someone's beard before and like they made a, <laughs> a beard beer which is interesting uh, but yeah yeast is everywhere organisms are everywhere yeah. uh, but what's crazy is just again that strain variety of almost uh, uh you have your golden retrievers you have our poodles there's so many different varieties out there uh but each are unique in its own char characteristic almost like how each dog looks completely different and that's that's something we like to highlight and really showcase and provide that experimentation because going back on the homebrewing, that's like where our love yeah. comes from is that experimentation of like, hey, choose a different hop, choose a different malt, choose a different yeast strain and like ha have fun with it. Like um, there, there's guidelines, but there's no like set rules. So you could always try something new, try something different and see what comes out of it. Yeah. Uh, and also traveling, right? Like uh, you, we, um, for example, I was able to get samples and when visiting, um, you know, uh, Cachaceria in Brazil or, you know, or, you know, or go in Mexico in a tequila area, right? Like, you know, you ask, you know, they're fine, you know, mostly those type of, um, you know, uh, beverage to like uh, natural fermentation, but that's how you, you know, you you get that and then you send it to the lab and then we all get counts like, what is in there, right? And then, you know, we start finding things and, you know, uh, so it's a little bit of both worlds, yeah. 
I think one of my uh, favorite stories too is like we actually partnered with Illumina, which is a huge genetic sequence bio company in San Diego back in 2013. And we were able to genetically sequence 96 of these strains. So we almost did like a, a 23andMe or Ancestry.com <laughs> and got like the different uh, full genome sequence to see like these different clays of like, oh, these came from Britain. These came from Germany. These That's genes awesome. are Holy similar. Crap. And then we had fun with it. So like uh, usually every October we come out with a Franken stout, which we just pitch all 96 strains in at once. And <laughs> oh, no. uh, it what becomes, does it taste like? Uh, is- it's an interesting beer. You got Belgian <laughs> notes. <interesting>. But not- <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, but it's fun, you know. One uh, example that I remember that I thought was super interesting, and uh, my show notes are on my phone, which is filming us right now, but it was the um, the extinct uh, plant, the cacao plant that was in South America, is that correct? Or Central America? Yeah, probably. Yeah. I Do think you guys was- remember the story of how you all, because it was thought to be gone, and you guys were able to cultivate the yeast from inside of the flower of the plant? Is that what I'm remembering? I believe something like that. I was not uh, currently involved with that project. Is it Marignon? Marignon. Yeah, yeah, Marignon. Yes, yes, yes. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It, was, uh, it was more related to uh, yeah, a person who was from, I think from, uh, I'm not 100% sure, but I think from around Peru. Um, and, um, yeah, this person like found, um, this, you know, uh, yeast strain in, in some of the, the, the flower of this, um, cacao and, uh, brought it here to the States and he worked with us kind of like in order to kind of like see what it could do basically. Yeah. But it's some sort of like what I try a beer was like, I would say we'll give you a, a some sort of like saison type of yeah. uh, mm. you know character to the beer. It's pretty phenolic, so maybe like yeah. a chocolate hef or something would be good with it. Yeah. You guys <laughs> sent us a little pitch of it. We I think we did a class. I can't remember if it was with Fall City or Against the Grain, but we did like a uh, like a saison, like a saison, like a dark saison, basically, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we used that in there. Um, and even before we we ended up putting it on some cacao nibs, but it actually had like a little essence of cacao kind of in that like the back of the phenol range that I don't know. So that was just to me when I was like, man, White Labs is fucking cool. Like, it's so crazy that you guys go all over the world and do these things, uh, which otherwise we just wouldn't have access to. They would just disappear into time. And you guys kind of preserve that, which I think is super, super cool. You you mentioned yeast being a little bit like uh, dogs. Are there any like yappy dog yeast that like <laughs> like this is just <laughs> ridiculous to work with? <laughs> uh, each each yeast strain has its own characteristics. Uh, the reason why like zero zero one is like our workhorse and our love child is because of how robust and how many styles it could do and uh, how viable it stays. But yeah, there there are many strains out there. Um, you're seeing it, even new strains today of like non alcoholic beer of using wild yeast of like. Um, each have their own quirks that you just need to learn, almost like training a dog. So mm-hmm. each dog can be trained. It's just you need to learn its flocculation characteristics or how much it attenuates and all those small details. And to- this this is coming a little bit from my own ignorance, but it, yeast mutates as you use it over time. How, is it the bank that kind of sets that at the ground level and you start you pull from that every time? Yes, so uh, a lot of our bank is cryogenically frozen, almost like Walt Disney, right? Minus 80 <laughs> Celsius. Almost. <laughs> but uh, what's nice is, yeah, you're barely taking any yeast to start propping it up, and we're able to prop that up in 21 days with uh, 30 quality checkpoints to make sure our yeast are robust, clean, ready to ferment those beers. Um, yeah, there are brewers that have that gone multiple generations over time. Maybe they lose some characteristics, maybe they lose some flocculation things, um, but they are asexually budding so it is the same uh yeast cell that's creating clones of itself um so over time yeah you might see some variation but to get that consistency back at least we have that frozen in time piece that you could restart and reuse every single time yeah D- does does white labs ever just like receive packages from <laughs> random strangers with swabs like swab kits in the mail like hey you should check this out yes actually uh we do a bunch <laughs> of like yeast banking um and we again we, we house private strains um so uh, it, it is confidential, but yeah, people do send us stuff and they're like, hey, I actually want to bank this this yeast strain because I like what it is, what what it does, and we bank it for them. Yeah, it even makes sense sometimes. We recommend that to people when, you know, mostly on mixed fermentations, right? Uh, you know, that will change pretty quickly, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I always, we always recommend to people when, you know, when you, when you think it's at its peak, right? Like you really love this beer, how it's fermenting, you know, send us a sample, we'll bank it, keep it as it is, right? In the cryogenic freezers and then keep going, you know, and if anything changes, well, it will change, but 
but it changes in a way that you don't like, you can always come back to the point when you liked it. So that's really cool. That's so cool. And another thing that I've heard of you all doing before is it, especially supporting the community of brewing is you can send in, you know, a sample for analysis and you all will run it through a gamut of tests and determine all sorts of quality checkpoints there. That's a service that you all do. Yeah. Um, so we have multiple services like that. We do try to do bundle packages. All that testing is actually done in San Diego. So that's our analytical lab. Um, that's somewhat my pride and enjoy just cause that's what I used to supervise and manage. And that's where I started, but yeah, we have a bunch of, uh, different, uh, quality high high level instruments such as gas chromatographs, uh, HPLCs. We have an alkalizer, so we have a plethora of tests that anyone could do um, or anyone could test for. So a lot of times we get finished beer and processed beer, but not only beer, but uh, RTDs, kombucha, wine, ciders. So we, we test anything and everything as much as possible, um, and I like to call it like the forensics lab of like <laughs> we get this help troubleshoot people's problems and or like maybe double check if they're hitting a certain baseline or standard that they're aiming for um so it's always a new day at, in the analytical lab because you never know what samples are coming in what you have to test yeah P part of my ignorance here but are there any you know universal mysteries in the yeast world that you like maybe are a little bit closer to getting solved than before i mean what's uh what's what's a puzzle right now uh, i feel like what what's always been a puzzle um is just again that that even with that full genetic sequence, uh, you could have genotypes versus phenotypes of like the gene could say something, but the way it's reflected or like shown on the outer appearance could could be different. Um, so it's almost like having a gut biome or like a mixed culture of like, although you might be changing one thing, you could be really affecting something else or like taking away for something else. So everything's in a like a harmonious balance. Um, but yeah, we are seeing more and more like mixed culture stuff or um just even like co-fermentations of not even wild things but two yeast strains and uh, yeah people trialing that yeah metabolic processes are very complex right so you know that's why every strain is unique right because they all have their own way path and way of you know so i think like um nowadays the like creating blends uh, has a lot of potential. Uh, I think that, you know, I think the industry in the future should keep on looking at that because, you know, by creating the right blend, that's a lot that we've been doing, you know, lately. And I think you can create unique beers with different characters and using the same strains we know today, right? Uh, one of the things that we always like to do on this show is take a little bit of a, a break in the conversation for Underberg. Uh, we call it a Berg break. Uh, they have been great friends of the show, so we'd love to share some with you if you're willing. Yeah, just, sure. All right, we'll just pass them down here. Are you guys Underberg fans? Love it. I love Underberg, so I'm a huge fan. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> At least it's not 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's only 11.22 a.m. <laughs> uh, it's 8 for me. You know? <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, there you go. We had really, really delicious, incredibly good, authentic, spicy Mexican food for dinner last night. So we were all like oh, this wow. morning, are we going to start our days with an Underberg? <laughs> but uh, we figured we'd wait for you guys. <laughs> yes. All right. Cheers, guys. Cheers, Underberg. Cheers. Cheers. All right, now everybody get your swab kits ready. Right. And just, uh... <laughs> there you go. How much has that killed? <laughs> <laughs> um, before we get too far away from it, did you all have any thoughts about the Kentucky Common? Love that. Now, you know, now the underwear yeah, is going to fail. But, um, um, yeah, I like, the, you know, the, the malt character of the beer. Um, and I think it's very easy to drink. So it's complex but the drinkability is good too like it and you know so we talked a little bit about everything that white labs does um out in the you know the brewer's world for yeast and stuff like that but one of the coolest things you guys do here as, as well is the tap room and you know experience coming and taking a tour and visiting uh premiere in that experience to me is um what you guys do with the kind of different flights and tastings that you guys are able to do with the facilities that you have here. Now that we've cleansed our palate with a, with a delicious Underberg, um, you guys have a few samples for us to try mm -hmm. that basically 
kind of represent what we've been talking about, how all these different yeasts are like different breeds of dog. I like that metaphor. We'll stick with it. They each kind of bring their own thing to the table. So you guys are basically here able to control for a lot of the variables, variables of the beer. We talked about water, hops, barley, but then you guys can play around and show what those different yeast expressions look like directly to folks. Uh, you guys want to just kind of explain how that works and then maybe talk us through how you would uh, let us like people to experience this tasting experiment? Yeah. Um, that's honestly my favorite like light bulb moment for a lot of people is when they actually try the beer. Uh, it's easy to explain, hey, like this yeast has this nuance or this flavor, but until you actually try it and taste it, that's when you like, get the full picture. Um, what's nice is our White Labs Bruco. Um, a lot of times we are split batching, so we're actually using it as an R&D lab in itself of um, yeast could behave one way that we know on um, the lab side, but by brewing it in a five barrel fermenter and seeing how it acts on the on the like a brewery side, we could really learn more about our yeast strain. So what we're doing is we're making the same base wort. So everything from the hops, the malt, the water are all the same. And we actually split batch them into two different fermenters and put a different yeast strain. So the yeast strain is our variable. So um, yeah, as you can see uh, right here, we have our alt beers um, with 029. Uh, as well as 036. So, um, is that what's the is that Dusseldorf? What's the 036? Oh, okay, yeah, the du Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf. Yeah, and yeah, 029 so, Kolsch. Yep. Yes, our Kolsch and Dusseldorf strain. Um, we uh, sell the heck out of your all's 029. That's another one I can hardly keep in stock just because people use it for Kolsch's, but then also it gets commonly used for people who can't lager. Uh, but I'm not as familiar with your all's Dusseldorf. I've had it a few times, but not as much. So, this will be a very interesting experience for me. Yeah, and what's nice too is like some of the uh, analytics that we're looking at too, uh, that's all available on whitelabsbrewingco.com. We're trying to, again, try to be as open source as possible. So we have our recipe there, our mm -hmm. fermentation connects of how the fermentation went, some of the parameters that we see of like attenuation rates, maybe diacetyl, uh, gluten reduction, because we also add a uh, clarity firm. So, um, but uh, it's really crazy to see. I, I picked this alt beer because this is currently on tap. What I think is a nice... A variation uh, between the two strains. Sometimes they're very slight nuance and you could small pick up some things. Uh, one of the cool ones that we've done before too is our uh, Taber IPA, our flagship IPA that uh, we use 001, our California Ale Yeast versus uh, 008, our East Coast. And like one turns out like a West Coast IPA and the other turns like a hazy IPA. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, wow. Like you, yeah. just that subtle difference of the yeast strain and you get Two yeah, some styles. people don't believe you. It's, it's like, what what do you mean? This is the same beer with different yeast. Like, yeah, that's exactly what it is. And they're like, no, you're lying. Huh. No, <laughs> no. And but, that's like that light bulb moment that you're talking about. Then you're like, oh shit, like yeast is actually the star of the show in these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like yeah. sometimes the color changes. Sometimes the mouthfeel completely changes. It, it's crazy. So the aroma, of the interaction of specific strains of yeast with the same hops are different right yeah, so yeah. even the can change aromas right uh ibus right so um there's so many things going on right that um it can, it can change completely so how would you guys recommend that we kind of start this tasting should we know which one's which or should we just start by kind of smelling and looking and you know we know which one's which i don't yeah. i wasn't paying attention <laughs> as per <laughs> usual but yeah i i personally <laughs> would do the blind route the like bjcp and just again try to take it subjectively look look at all the things you would usually do for a regular beer tasting and see see what comes out. Because a lot of times, right, there's there's a difference between tasting and just drinking. Sure. So um, it's fun to go through the motions of tasting. Okay, they smell completely different. <laughs> Talk us through it, David. <laughs> well, I do, I do have some of the literature in front of me, so I'm gonna try and ignore that as much <laughs> as possible. <laughs> um, but the, the one I have in my left hand is really, it's got a sweeter nose, um, like a dark fruit. Um, and then the one I have in my right hand is far more caramel, toasty. Like a, yeah, toasty, bready. Yeah, almost like a pepper in there. And that, if you had told me these were the same malt bill, I honestly would not have. Well, I would have believed you because you work at White Labs. But <laughs> <laughs> but if John told me, I definitely wouldn't believe him. So. Accurate. That is um, nuts. All right, let's taste it. All right, so was the one on the right the Kolsch? The one on the right, the more, more? I mean, the, uh, the Kolsch yeast. Uh, so Dusseldorf is the more malty one that usually comes out. And then the one that we have on the left, the fruitier one, was your all's uh, Kolsch. Kolsch. Okay. Yep. Excellent. That's incredibly interesting. Goodness gracious. 
But yeah, uh, we, I need to start carrying Dusseldorf. <laughs> right? This it, is it, excellent. It's funny how like we could say certain flavor parameters and stuff, but again, until you brew with yeah. it, um, it's all subjective as well. So. It's really funny because I guess I actually do use it usually on lighter beers. Um, so I'm sure some of that fruity caramel is it playing with those darker roasted malts. But it's really funny that that's actually the uh, yeah. in my head. That's the flavor profile that I associate with your all's uh, 029. Um, but I got it completely wrong. That's the that's the three six, right? Yeah, and that's what happens, you know, uh, many many times here or in San Diego. You know, when you see brewers brewers coming, uh-huh. you know, and drink their beers, it's like, oh, you know, they're like they get ideas, right, yeah. to write a recipe and you know what they like from you know one strain or the other, and that happens a lot. You know, like it's kind of cool to know that some brewers coming to our tap rooms are actually finishing or starting their you know recipes by you know tasting our beers. A lot of the times too, when when we were like developing recipes with people, uh, they we we kind of call all of our recipes that we do in our shop like crowdsourced. Somebody will make it, somebody will tweak it, somebody else will make it, tweak it. Da 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 da. So the wisdom of the crowds is what forms a lot of them. But sometimes when people are trying to like perfect something, they're like, oh, I think I'm going to switch to like uh, Cascade from Columbus, or I think I'm going to add like, God, God help us, a little more caramel malt or something like that. But a lot of the times, just trying a different subtle yeast switch can actually get that thing that you're looking for. Um, and this is actually an incredibly good example of that, just because of how different the, the expression is. The con- the contrast is in these two is it's. It's incredible. I mean, this is just straight like fruit to me, and there's some maybe some biscuit too, but then the other one's just caramel. I mean, it's mm-hmm. so multi. Yeah, and that's always what we try to like say is uh, with going off again with the breeds of dogs is they're so different. If you com- want, if that flavor style is not hitting what you want, change your yeast strain. And that's like the number one thing. Like, yes, you could optimize your health and how that fermentation of that yeast strain is to like fine tune some stuff. But if you're looking for something like that's not there. Change yeah. that yeast strain. Yeah, yeast. Uh, yeah, strain selection. Right, it's, it's first. Right, then, like he said, you can actually, you know, play around a little bit with temperature, pH rate, right, uh, oxygen level. It's all about oxygen levels and such. But, you know, if you want that character, you need to go for that specific strain. Right. What's so I do have the literature in front of me, uh, which is. Uh, really altering this experience because the Dusseldorf with the higher Play-Doh actually tastes drier to me. I, I agree. And that doesn't make sense. <laughs> like, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, again, it yeah. goes off of like glycerol production. There's so many things that add to a beer that sometimes aren't monitored or parametered. Uh, but yeah, like it's crazy, right? Because let's finish at a, what? Four point? Uh, what was, uh, a four three for the Dusseldorf. Four three? And, and then the Kolsch. Two was, eight for yeah. the Kolsch, which is dramatically different (laughs) yeah the attenuation rates but yeah just the way it finishes and like the crispness and bitterness i could totally see why uh the dusseldorf seems like it finished lower Mm -hmm. another thing i always think is fun uh people ask a lot like well how how do i make my beer better like how is how do i get this to be like better what's the best beer what's the best kolsch it's all at the end of the day a matter of perception so when you guys taste these side by side i think i mean you you guys can maybe answer i think i know but do you guys have one that you prefer do you guys have one that you like better just as what you think of as an alt beer in your head when you taste it my personal favorite is the 036 that's what i've been drinking on the menu currently uh but yeah it it what's funny is when we do our centuries for releasing these beers sometimes it's split half and half of like oh half the people like 029 half the people like 036 and Again, that's what tasting is. It's very subjective of what's a good beer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I wasn't even thinking about it in the context of like alt beer, like which is the better like alt beer or more characteristic alt beer. I just I prefer the the Kolsch yeast one. But yeah, if I guess if I had to think about like what exemplifies the alt beer style a little bit more, it would be the Dusseldorf. Yeah, and that's so cool about what you guys too, because as you said, then you get to talk to people about it, and instead of it just being your own opinion in your own head, you get to actually get people to you know use words that you can kind of then quantify. And then when a brewery has those questions, you can come back and be like, yeah, we wish our, you know, alt was a little bit fruitier. Or we wish our alt was a little breadier. And you'd be like, oh, what little cheese are you using? Like, et cetera, et cetera. That is super, super cool. And an experience everybody should have when you're in Asheville or uh, at San Diego to take a trip to White Labs. <laughs> yeah. And you guys have tasted thousands of beers before. Um, and it, it, there's monotony to it after a while. Um, just just in this little exercise, I'm like, I, I pretty much forgot that it was an alt beer i'm like these are just two really different beers Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I feel kind of like a kid again because I'm like, I, I really don't yeah. care about the alt beer. I just wanted to like, how the hell are these so different? <laughs> yeah. And I think that goes off of like some of my favorite beers that White Labs Brew Cup has made is um, uh, it's when we throw in a yeast strain that's not to the style and it turns out something completely crazy and really good. Yeah, you so, break the rules and then yeah, you know, something so, else happens. Right? What was it? We did a hoppy lager, but with a 590 or French Saison. Mm -hmm. And it dried out this lager so well. And it was just essentially the hops. And it, like it was my favorite. And it's like, what style do I put this in? I, yeah. I can't put this in the style. Yeah, the BJCP is like weeping right now. <laughs> <laughs> Good. That's what this podcast is for. Uh, I think we can all agree that uh, these are great beers. And we can also agree that there's nothing more disappointing than tasting diastole in a beer yeah and it seems that uh some recent news that i heard from you all that you all are getting rid of diastole <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's what's happening you get you're just saying no more diastole from your mouth to god muller <laughs> yeah so you you really you all recently released a, a new yeast that uh cuts down on that enzyme it's enzyme. an enzyme yeah it's uh it's called a l a l d c and it's an enzyme that, you know, um, what's the name? It is called a Bruzyme D. Bruzyme D. I believe, yeah. So yeah. it is an enzyme. So uh, we actually took it from um, almost like a another organism, but uh, it's because it's able to reduce um, ALDC, which is uh, alpha acetolactate, which is the precursor to diacetyl. So uh, this enzyme is able to react on um on that precursor and uh, convert it quickly versus uh, the natural uh, conversion of diastole is is through the yeast of if you have healthy yeast they'll naturally reconvert it so um, most yeast strains all yeast strains produce diastole um, it's just you're producing almost like amino acid you're producing baling so right uh, so the workforce of life you're producing all these different amino acids so you're always going to have alpha acetolactate in your beer um, and as long as your yeast is healthy, it should reduce it. But if you want to speed up your timeline, have less fermentation tank time, um, you could add this enzyme in and it's going to uh, act on this alpha acetolactate, this precursor, and then convert it to a flavorless compound. Um, the only downside is if you add it too late of uh, this enzyme, it's not going to work on diacetyl because diacetyl is always mm -hmm. already there. So we say we recommend pitching this enzyme at the time of uh, your yeast pitch as well as time of dry hopping because also with dry hopping you might have some additional fermentation happening mm. so um anytime fermentation is happening have this uh, aldc and it, yeah it quickens lagering time it quickens fermentation take time but yeah a lot of the yeast strains as long as they're healthy should reduce it These, this is just cleaving off a couple extra days and making sure you don't have that worry so less risk and that's not the only uh, like kind of paving that you guys have done in the enzyme world just a few sentences about some of the other products that you guys put out like clarity firm has been such a game changer for so many people yeah. uh, in so many different ways and then i think you guys did the the version of I, I see a lot of people make it now but when brute ipas became a thing like, i think that was you guys too at least kind of they should still the be first person i heard that from yeah it was like a, the what was ultra that, beta firm. Yeah. yeah the ultra firm exactly mm -hmm. um yeah a uh, clarity firm is it's interesting like i had so many like um uh homebrewers you know um all sweaty at homebrew con just giving me hugs and <laughs> yes exactly. thanking me then they were able to drink beer after i don't know how long because and so for the listeners who don't know a clarity firm was originally designed as like a stabilizer but what it also does is just break down gluten mm -hmm. like not 100 percent, so it's not gluten free but it gets it down under like two parts per billion or something uh, like uh usually under 20 okay. as long as yeah, you do yeah. a proper dosage yeah yeah and um, so you can just basically add it. I think you add it when you add your yeast, if I recall. Yeah, um, it's meant for chill haze. Okay. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but it, you know, we found that it reduces you know gluten too. Yeah. So it reduces gluten to a, a, an amount that you said people are hugging you like. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the people who are like uh, intolerant to gluten, you know, um, you know, it, and it depends on right. Everyone is different. They have different tolerances. As you said, metabolic science is complicated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you know, it, it's a matter of trying it but many people who were not able to have beer because they will get sick using um you know clarity firm they were now able to drink beer again that's awesome uh you got a couple things in front of you uh pure pitch you want to talk about that yeah 
So I don't know if to say if this is new anymore. <laughs> it's been already there, but it's kind of newish, right? There's our new uh, pouch, our um, what we next call generation. Pure Pitch Next Generation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and now it's all based more in um, a cell count, right? Um, we wanted to give um, brewers, you know, um, kind of like, uh, I don't know what's the best way of saying it. It's like pitch like a, the way I like to say it is like pitch like a pro brewer. Yeah. Because right? kind of back to what you were saying at the very beginning of the conversation, when we started homebrewing like, you know, 20, 30 years ago or whatever, if you could find that little package of dry yeast on the shelf and you don't know its history, you don't know how long it's been sitting there. See, Light, White Labs kind of led the way on innovating in that realm as well. Because uh, I remember the old, like the old uninflated Coke bottle, like test tubes or whatever. <laughs> and then you guys graduated to the, it's the, the positive pressure, like uh, packaging system, which was, so I don't know, that's something you guys are always mindful of. But yeah, you were, you were going there. But what is this no, one no. expressed that's just different from the thing you would find on the shelf at Liquor Barn? Well, you know, um, what we like to say is that, you know, like if you pitch one of these pouches in, in a five gallon, 20 liter, uh, and it will give you seven and a half million souls per mil, which is, you know, some people know as a, a Sierra Nevada pitch rate, right? You know, you know, you can, it's up to what you want or the beer you're making, you know, you can go from, even you can go down to seven million uh, souls per mil. If you're making a Cezanne, let's say, right, you want to under pitch a little more, you can go to 10 million cells per mil or even higher for, um, you know, laggers. But, you know, this is a pitch rate that will give you, you know, what we call, you know, kind of like a, you know, like an, a fermentation that will, you know, shouldn't cause any problems, right? Like, you know, um, even up to like higher, you know, um, Play-Dohs or high gravity, you know, beers, you know, this, this should be, it's a, it's the right pitch weight. So you have great fermentations. So you're really bringing that like professional level yeah. ingredient to a homebrew. Yeah. Level. And, and yeah. it's been a little of a debate, right? Like, you know, I was a homebrewer too. And, and, and some homebrewers, you know, usually homebrewers talk in total cells, right? Like, uh, Oh, how many cells are in that pouch? Right. And, uh, I think that's important. It's good to know, but you know, when you go into the pro side of things, no one talks about how many cells you got in your pitch in your, you know, what, how many cells you pitch in total. It's how many cells you have for that specific batch mm -hmm. for that word. Right. And I think that's uh, that's what it actually, what, what's important because you need exact amount of cells or the amount of cells you need just to, ferment that specific batch what yeah when it, so we <clears throat> will occasionally do some like uh professional brews that like co-branded with us um and one of the first ones that i did several years ago was with uh jd vasher over at cumberland brewing and uh we're ready to pitch the yeast and he pulls out this microscope and i'm like well what are we doing he's like well we're gonna count and i'm like <laughs> i was like i, I can't count to one seven. billion in one one billion in two <laughs> yeah and i was like i i don't he's like well how much and is it supposed to be there's like seven million i'm like dude dude we don't have time for that <laughs> <laughs> and uh he, he's like no 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 like I'll, I'll show you there's a method i was like well what what if it's like 10 million what if we do too much he's like don't worry about it it's fine like yeah. we're gonna make it work <laughs> yeah i think that's my favorite part about the next generation yes it, it has more perforations yes uh, the viability is a lot better but again like what pablo was saying is uh we're taking that math that scary math and doing it for you um sure. a lot of times my analogy is um how people bake, right? Uh, a cup of flour is going to weigh different grammage every time you take a cup of flour. Mm -hmm. So it's not always by volume because yeast cells are going to flocculate at different, the density is going to be different. So by cell counting or just knowing how many cells you're pitching every time, you're going to get a more consistent fermentation because you're pitching by that unit. And um, yeah, if you over pitch, you won't get as much cell growth. You maybe not won't get as much beer flavor as we see here. So like by being more consistent on that unit of cell growth and like how many cells you're pitching, you're going to hopefully less risk and more consistent fermentations. Yeah. And you know what it's really cool. And I said this again, because, you know, I come, I still homebrew sometimes and we all homebrewers, we all like um, geeks by choice. <laughs> and, Nature versus nurture. And, and we have a really cool calculator. You know, if you go to yeastman.com and the calculator, right, it will tell you, you know, uh, you choose, you know, you you just put your the temperature you're gonna ferment, right? Your batch size, right, and the, the degree Play-Doh or you know, starting gravity. 
and it will tell you how much we recommend to pitch but also you can actually dial in there's a, a little like a slide where you can actually it will tell you the sales per mill and the sales per mill per degree plato and then you if you want to really want to geek out you can actually move that slider and go down or up in the cell count and choose this exactly cell count you want to pitch yeah that's actually really easy to find so every pouch has a qr code and it has uh, like what pablo was saying is our calculator our yeast information um and then recently we added our uh, estimated viability of like around what viability this pouch might be just based off of uh almost like a generalized uh, assumption of uh, using our data of what we've taken over the years and being like, hey, based off this pouch, after six months, it's going to be around this viability. Yeah, you see the QC report, yeah. Everything. Mm -hmm. And one more thing you guys have recently launched that are, a lot of our customers have already, we, I think we got this in like two weeks ago, but you guys have started making dry yeast as well, which is really super cool to see. Um, a, because it like in a time when sometimes yeast can be a little bit hard to get, these have a lot longer shelf life and stuff. But talk us through just a little bit about how you guys developed and brought these uh, dry strains to market. Well, you know, it was, uh, you know, like uh, nowadays more and more people, you know, starting getting, starting using more dry yeast and stuff. And I think one of the biggest thing was like, you know, um, there's some dry yeast out there that were like comparable to what people thought it was California ale and it's actually not. So, um, you know, uh, genetically they're different, right? So we wanted to, for people who wanted to start for whatever reason, like you say, you know, you want to keep a few bricks there just in case, uh, or it's easy for you, or you live in a, an area then it's um, too hot, right? During the summer. And so you don't trust, you know, shipping or blah, blah, blah. You know, um, you're able to use California because, you know, this is uh, actually it's the first time, you know, this Cali ale, same as this one, is in dry form, right? So if you want to keep the same characteristics of the liquid uh, WP01 in dry form, you know, this is the one. Yeah. And my favorite part, too, is, again, like we always try to keep our products as cold as possible, ship to, ship to you on ice and everything. But there's always mishaps, you know, like you never know when there's going to be a strike or anything. But by having dry yeast, these ship better. There's two years shelf life. Again, we're trying to provide as many fermentation opportunities for the user as possible. So we're, we're not saying we do love our dry yeast. We're always backing our dry yeast, uh, sorry, our liquid yeast, but we try to apply try to get more options available. So we do have 001 California ale yeast in dry, as well as 066, our London fog or top selling hazy strain. Um, and then we're also looking at a lager yeast to try. So yeah. again, we're just trying to provide as much opportunity as possible. And that's the bottom line is yeah. give people options. Yeah. Usually what's happening is like people st still, you know, still using the, the liquid, but they keep a few bricks, uh, for emergencies. <laughs> yeah, I was yep. about to say, oh shit, yeast. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, you know, and it's there, you know, shelf life's great. And, uh, you know, and you can have, you know, the same character on your beer. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for everything today. We don't want to take up too much more of your time. Is there anything coming up that you really want people to know about, though? Um, I know on uh, my personal favorite that we're also trying to focus yeah. a lot more on is, again, just rekindling those connections, just providing options as much as possible. Um, we are rekindling our um, customer club. So yeah. everyone remembers the customer yep. club of turning the files and everything. Um, we have a new group of fresh eyed uh, employees that we want to get that connection. Uh, so we just rebranded it to Fermentation Society. And uh, we're releasing more and more strains in that bank. Again, going off that strain variety, getting new different strains out there. We want to hear feedback from you guys of what strains you want to play around with. Again, get that experimentation going. So Fermentation Society, we have whole new um, newsletters about interviewing homebrewers, interviewing retail stores, um, seeing what's happening even on our side of like our uh, Bruco of what beers we're brewing, what foods we're fermenting. So all our food actually uh, in our pizza is actually five, WLP 518, our Opshug Hawaii yeast. And it just adds this extra tanginess in, in pizza dough, right? It's not using uh, regular baker's yeast. So um, just having that idea of like, hey, there's so many things that are fermented out there, coffee, chocolate, so many different things. And just having that fun mindset of like, hey, let, let's start experimenting. Let's start interacting with people. Um, going off those different strains, we also have like almost like a collect them all of like <laughs> we're releasing strains. Um, I, I believe, strains. yeah, like 
bi-monthly or quarterly. Um, but yeah, these specialty strains that we're taking out of the vault, we're also giving people uh, pins every time you order pre-order oh, the strains. Cool. Awesome. So it's going to be a collect them all. So uh, talking about that 096 that we were talking about, we're actually going to release that. It's actually available to purchase right now uh, with the pen, a pin. So WLP 096 freaking freaking yeast blend. And um, I know currently for myself, I'm working with a uh, claw hammer supply, a uh, homebrew oh, supply yeah. here in Asheville to uh, collab and release a new strain um, that they're looking for. So hopefully it's going to be all around lager yeast blend that uh, is going to be the next strain for this exclusive release for fermentation society. So again, it's just another form of ways White Labs connect to the end user to connect with homebrewers and again, get that fun experimentation mindset. How, yeah. how, do, how do I join? Um, so you could just go on yeastman.com and there is a, once you create a profile, there's just a check mark box of like, would you like to enroll with fermentation society? And that's how you get that communication going. Very nice. Pablo, what do you got? Just like, you know, like how we started talking, right? We, you know, just want to tell everyone, we a bunch of nerds and geeks <laughs> and we love beer. And, um, uh, and that's what I think it's, we make the difference, right? Like we are here to help, right? And. And that's the whole thing. Sometimes like people are like, oh, you guys, Wild Labs so big, such a huge company. And we're not, you know, it's, it's, we're not that big, you know, and it's, it's, it's about like the passion of people who works here. Like, uh, you know, like we here to help. We here, you know, like when people called you and, you know, we are there to help. And uh, I think that's what it makes a, a, a big difference, right? Like uh, as a consumer, right? The first thing you want is like calling and not being on hold for like forever. Mm -hmm. Forever. And uh, so uh, that's and because we care, we we want this in we want this inter industry to keep growing as much as possible, and that's what we're here for. Awesome, John. I'm just going to shout out uh, tasting beer kind of mindfully, like we've been doing here today. We all kind of uh, said what we thought maybe our favorites of these two were. I think I said that my favorite was actually the Dusseldorf, but now that I sit here and look at my glasses at the end of this podcast, <laughs> I noticed by my sipping ratio that I've actually been sipping on the Kolsch a little bit more. I will I, agree. I like the Kolsch better. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, are, what are your guys' like uh, poll results at the end of the podcast? Kolsch. Oh, he liked them both. No, David drank them both. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. And in addition to that, if you if you like these things, it, obviously come seek out White Labs, but uh, wherever you are in the country, find your local homebrew club uh, and go hang out with them too, because a lot of that stuff happens in real time and you can talk to the people who brewed it and made it. Um, you've probably got a local homebrew supply shop close to you. Uh, we've been in business in our shop for eight years. Uh, I've worked in another homebrew store for four or five years before that. White Labs has always been like the go-to yeast. You can get some stuff. There's a lot of new, there's a lot of companies out there that all make great stuff. Uh, but the thing, I, the, the reason I've always bought White Labs is just because of how consistent it is, um, how innovative it is, and that there's always something new to try as well. So yeah, White Labs is awesome. David? I'm going to play the Uno reverse card here. Uh, I don't have anything to plug, but I do have questions for you all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so you both travel. You're from San Diego and Pablo, your territory. Are there any breweries that people should know about? Hmm. They're doing crazy stuff with White Labs. Um, I would say... In my opinion, I would say uh, we have release i don't know if you heard uh acid trip um that it's a it's a blend do you guys have you heard about tripping animals yeah okay it's a brewery in miami and all the carousels are done with a blend they they kept for a long long time i don't even they don't even remember how they got it <laughs> um but they make you know it makes you know, really good base, you know, so uh, kettle sour beer. So one day um, I was visiting them and we start talking and say, hey, we want to do something with Wild Labs. And I was like, what about your, you know, uh, this, you know, proprietary, whatever you want to call it. They didn't call it proprietary, but it's like, oh yeah, we would love to release it. So we got it a sample, you know, Send it to the lab. We saw what it was, and you know, um, we actually brew with it to see, the, you know, the characters, the characteristics of this, and it was awesome. You know, like uh, per I personally brewed with it, and you know, it creates this like, um, I would say like sour pineapple base. I I'm honestly, I want to be a hundred percent honest. I'm not really into kettle sour beers much. Mm -hmm. Somehow I get this grainy 
but this this was like different and i think it's it was a um, kind of like the the blend of different things going on in there so we decide we decided to you know release it and yeah it's uh, it's called um um acid trip right <laughs> uh, <laughs> and i think uh you know uh they making they're doing a great job and you know i think that's something i don't know that's nice. awesome. i'm gonna take the easy answer here and uh the reason why I stay with this community and everything is, again, how easygoing everyone is and how open everyone is. Is If you ever have a question or if you ever need to like borrow some, ask to use some of their equipment to test something or double check, such as a deal meter, ATP meter, um, everyone's open. So I always love stopping by breweries, making friends. Uh, that's what's great about this workshop, too, is how many friends I've made. Uh, throughout the years and just seeing them at CBC and just, again, re rekindling that friendship. Um, and like, that's what I love about the, this industry is that wealth of knowledge and how everyone's hungry to learn more. And um, everyone understands like, hey, th there's always multiple ways to answer and learning those multiple ways. And then finally, did yeast domesticate humans or did humans domesticate <laughs> yeast? <laughs> Ooh, I do not know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> the uh, gene sequence that has been the farthest away from the planet Earth, uh, I think this sh shuttle has already launched, is uh, yeast DNA. Uh, they put it into a, uh, one of those like long-range satellites, shoot it out into space. It's going to come back in like 50 years, and they're going to analyze what uh, the radiation in deep space did to the genome. And just because you know the yeast genome is one of the ones we've been working with the longest. So my argument is that if the uh, evolution means just spreading your DNA as far and wide as you can, Yeast domesticated humans. They got us to work for them and shoot their DNA off way into outer space. We could be yeast, actually, because uh, the family tree, we're closer. We could be yeast. We, we, yeah, we're, we're closer to yeast no. than uh, lactobacillus so, like bacteria. So we could be yeast. So, know? okay, now I'm imagining like an episode of This Is Us, except <laughs> instead of mushrooms, it's yeast. <laughs> Uh, okay, on my end, I'd like just to, to plug you all, uh, the, specifically the, the, the pizza here. Uh, the, the pizza here in this restaurant that you all have in Asheville. Uh, just stop by on your next visit because it is great pizza. You know, like you said earlier, the Quebec yeast was used for the crust. Um, it's so good. Stop by, have some beers. Uh, say hi and, and enjoy some pizza. Yeah, and it, it, I think it's, it, again, it comes to flavors, right? And... At one point, you know, society just wanted things fast and didn't care about flavors. And, you know, yes, it takes a little longer to make a pizza dough with brewer's yeast, but the, the flavor's there, right? So I think it's, uh, that's what it matters. Um, not how fast you do it, not how easy it is. It's what better product, final product. That's pretty much everything in life. Yep. So <laughs> with that, thank you all so much. Thanks thank for inviting you. us into your lab today. We really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you.